Well, Tony artists. Clark was one of them early artists too that I forgot that was from Detroit that was real big. He had a record I called You're the Entertainer, which was number one record for him. But unfortunately, a lot of our our great artists and good artists died too young. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was a good one. He was a great one. And he also did some writing and producing, uh, Tony Clark. You know, lo looking back, who who are the artists that that you remember? You know, in the early '60s, whose music has held up well over the course of the years? You know, who who do you think were some of the greatest artists that came out of Detroit, uh, whether they were famous or not? Oh boy, put you on the spot there. No, you didn't put me on the spot. I, ha I hate to put somebody above the Temptations because me and Eddie Kendricks are so tight. Well, the Temptations but when you talk have, about, have a good track record. <laughs> yeah, they have a good track record. But before the Temptations, you're talking about artists that come out of Detroit. And I haven't even mentioned his name. It even came out of my mouth. And me and him was good friends. And, and me and his sister was, was good friends. And I worked for her, her publishing company in, in Los Angeles for a while, and his name was Little Willie John. Yeah. When, you, when it comes to, when you when you say it, who's held up over the years, and talking about Detroit. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get a fever here, I think. Right, you talk, you talk about, when you talk about Detroit, and who I think the greatest, some of the greatest artists that you got to talk, you know, in that same breath, you would have to mention Little Willie. Little Willie John, when you talk about greats, I mean, as well as Jackie Wilson, because yeah. you're talking about greats, you'd have to talk about all around the world. We call that, we call it, grits ain't groceries, eggs ain't poultry. Uh, you have to talk about all around the world. You have to talk about fever. You have to talk about talk to me. You have to talk about uh, 24 hours of the day. You have to talk about heartbreak. It's killing me. I mean, and if you want to go back to when we were kids in school, you have to go back to his first little record. Mommy, what happened to my Christmas tree? Uh, you, you didn't think I knew that one, did you? When, when uh, just a little young kid in school. How about somebody like... Uh... Oh, and that was another little kid that came in the late 60s. His name was... They used to call him Lil Carl Carlton. Carl Carlton, which made a record called Competition Ain't Nothing. Uh -huh. And then he, he did a... I got one of his records. Everlasting Love. Yeah. Here I Stand With My Everlasting Love. Carl Carlton was, a, was a, a nice artist who was not a Motown artist. And there's so many things that I even forgot to mention. Mention them. Detroit has had so many artists that... that when I start talking, you know, I miss a lot of people. And I'm glad you said greatest because when you talk about greatest, you have to talk about Jackie Wilson. You have to talk about Little Willie John. You have to talk about The Temptations. I mean, when you talk about Detroit, you're talking about greats. You have to talk about an Aretha Franklin when you talk about greats from Detroit. John Lee Hooker? You have to talk about Sir John Lee Hooker. Because he was the, you talk about blues, he was the greatest blues singer that ever came from Detroit. Did you, did, did you ever get a chance to meet him? Oh, man, yeah, I met John Lee Hooker. He was a strange kind of guy. He sung, he sung the blues. As a matter of fact, John Lee Hooker was, he, he always played in clubs yeah. all over Detroit and all around Detroit. And, uh, I was not a real strong blues man, but Lee, that's Lee Rogers, yeah. he was, and he hung around John Lee Hooker all the time, and when John Lee Hooker might have been playing at the club, a lot of times Lee would drag me to the club and say, let's let's go back to the club and do, do this and do that, but yeah, when you talk about greats, you have to talk about a John Lee Hooker, because you know, he was probably the greatest blues singer to ever come from Detroit. Uh, Gut bucket blues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what I call it. Oh, yeah, but yeah. the greatest blues singer was Lou Willie John. Because Lou Willie John was an, what I call an impromptu blues singer. You could call him on the stage 
anytime Louis John, John could walk into a club and somebody could call him on the stage and and he was a little show off anyway he could get on stage and sing with any band at any time I mean just right off the cuff mm -hmm. impromptu just right he could jump and do it wasn't nobody no greater than Louis John doing that and he was a little guy how about his sister Mabel oh Mabel she was a great blues singer too Mabel had a lot of songs on Stax Records and Mabel John was also one of the Raylettes that sang with Ray Charles. Really? Yeah. M Mabel John was one of the Raylettes. I didn't know that. Yeah, she was. I've been knowing her what I consider most of my life. Mabel John and Lou Will John. But she had some of the, the big blues records in the early 60s of Stax Records. Who are some of the, the, your favorite people as, 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 as persons that you ran into uh, you know, when you were playing music uh, during those times? Who, who, what people stood out as just really good folk? Really good folk? In mm -hmm. um, all my traveling, and going around, people that stood out in my mind were, believe me, you. When I say this, you ain't gonna believe it. But guys that I personally like, Tommy James, personally, mm -hmm. one of the greatest guys I ever ran into, and a real likable guy. That's Tommy James and the Sh of the Shondell. Right, yeah. I, I'm, I, talking I, about, I I'm talking about. I'm talking about. I'm talking. Well, I'm letting you know. I'm talking about Crimson and Clover, Tommy right, James. Yeah. Moni, Moni, Tommy James. Yeah. He was a great guy. He was a great guy to know and a great guy to be around. Uh, um. Um. Uh, gee. Um. Uh, Tony Orlando, a great guy to be around. Me and Tony could get together and talk about old times. I was coming back from Las Vegas one night, you know, to see Diana on her closing night. Yeah. And I, got, I got happened to get on the plane with Tony. And, and we sat right next to each other. And it, it, it was funny because he was sitting on the plane we were coming back from Las Vegas and he had a cowboy hat on and he had covered his face so he could take a nap and the stewardess sat me right next to him <laughs> and uh, I didn't at first I didn't know who he was and you know I just sit in the chair and the stewardess kept coming by can I get you something he kept saying no and all of a sudden, <laughs> stewardess came by again. Can I get you some? He said, I'm trying to get some sleep. I said, no, and he pushed the hat up. And when he pushed the hat up, and he looked and saw me, <laughs> and I looked and saw him, oh, dang. we are, man, he couldn't believe it. What you doing, man? Vegas. And we got to talking, you know, and we got to talking about old times and, and we sit and, you know, he talked about Talma and Joyce. And then we talked about the Marcells and about his first record, about my first record coming to my palace. And we talked about, uh, you know, just being young guys around Detroit coming up when he had yeah. a record called Halfway to Paradise. I don't know if you remember that by Tony Orlando. Mm -hmm. That was his first record. His, that was his first big record. I'm only halfway to paradise. And, um, you know, we, I talked about that, and we talked about coming to my palace, and we just, had, we just had fun. It was a short ride from Vegas to L.A., you know, and we didn't really have enough time to talk, but we... And, and then uh, he related an incident. He said, he said, Prentice, you know, one of the strangest things that ever happened to me. 
and he was telling me about him and the girls, which Don, which was Joyce and Talma, going to play a prison in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And they were on stage singing. And he looked out in the audience and saw one of the Marcells, the boy who used to sing bass at the Marcells. Really? Yeah, in the penitentiary. Mm. And Tony said he called him on stage with him. He called him up on stage and they said, <laughs> hey, I mean, he, told me, he, said, he said it was a fun time. You know, uh, we just sit around and talked about old times. But Tony Orlando was a great guy. Now, you did some stuff with Hall Notes, too. Uh, yeah. That was, uh, that was when I was with um, Eddie Kendricks. A lot later. And David Ruffin. Yeah, that was like in the late 80s. That was after uh, um, I was traveling with Eddie Kendricks, and David Ruffin came out on the road with Eddie and started traveling. So Eddie and David... So uh, Hall and Oates was, was getting ready to go into the Apollo Theater. And uh, they wanted somebody to go in the Apollo Theater with them. And uh, rightly so. <laughs> You're talking about going into the biggest black theater in the country on 125th Street in Harlem. And two white boys going in there to do something for the National Negro College Fund. You want two of the greatest black singers to go in there with you. So um, he wanted Eddie Kendricks and David Ruffin to go in with him. And so that's how we got a chance to go, because I was on the road with Eddie and David at the time. And uh, that was in 1985. And, uh, and the company... And at that particular time, uh, Eddie and David cut a live track with them called The Way You Do The Things You Do, live at the Apollo. Yeah. And, uh, and that was a real uh, different experience. Those guys are great guys. Those guys are down to earth. I mean, they just like brothers. When I say brothers, like homeboys. <laughs> they are. They are. You're talking about. You talking about somebody who who got it together, Hall and Oates, really was really was down to earth. Tony Danza, down to earth. Tony Danza. Yeah. After the Apollo gig, uh, Hall uh, Hall and Oates had had rented a a, a little club down in uh, in the village. The village is Greenwich Village in, yeah. in New York for us to have an after party. We had a little after party and had a, a select group of people coming in. And Tony Danza was one of the guys, you know, that uh, that we happened to come and, and uh, party with. And he's a great guy. Now, now you have another connection to the Apollo. Your uncle, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I had an uncle who was, um, who used to take pictures at the Apollo Theater. His name was Gordon Anderson, and he was the official photographer at the Apollo Theater. And, um, uh, You got to see him all of them. Yeah. He got to see, I mean, everything. Everybody that was anybody. That's right. He got them, and he took their pictures. I mean, all the greats. I'm talking about Billy Holiday, Ink Spots, Mill Brothers, the Mills Brothers, the Platters, Pig Meat Markham. <laughs> Here comes the judge. <laughs> yeah. Moms Mabley, Nat King Cole. Earl Grant, I don't know if you know who Earl Grant is. Earl Grant, Bill Doggett, I mean the greatest entertainers that ever lived. Yeah, he got. To, you got to spend some summers in New York, which kind of oh, yeah. influenced you too. 
Yeah, I spent um, a lot of summers in Brooklyn, New York with my uncle. Uh, I had an uncle that I used to sing with um, with John Hendrix and the Swing Buddies, and then he also sung with the Ink Spots. His name was Joe Hall, and uh, he lived in Brooklyn. I used to spend summers with him, so I got a chance to, uh, you know, to be around a lot of the great groups like Little Anthony and the Imperials, uh, which were in some of the early days was the DuPonts. Anthony had a group called the DuPonts. I got a chance to be around people like uh, uh, the Dell Vikings. I got a chance to be around Chuck Jackson. I don't know if you know who that is. Oh yeah, Chuck Jackson. Yeah, great army. Yeah. Yeah. Got a chance to be around Tommy Hunt. Um, I got a chance to be around uh, Felix Cavallari. Yeah, Young Rascals. Yeah. You know, people like that. Got a chance to be around Johnny Maestro. I don't know if you know who that is. He was the lead singer for The Crest, a group called The Crest, 16 Eight Candles. candles. You know, and it was a, and, a, and there was a place in, in Brooklyn called the Brooklyn Fox. It was the Fox Theater in Brooklyn, so they called it the Brooklyn Fox to distinguish it from any other Fox Theater. There was a lot of Fox Theaters around the country. Um, but the Brooklyn Fox. So I got a, you know, got a chance to, uh, to be at the Brooklyn Fox a lot of times to see a lot of, of people. And, uh, and there were a lot of great groups. Did you ever but none no greater than Little Anthony and Imperials. Really? Little, oh, man. The Little Anthony and Imperials was the greatest group before the Temptations. Little Anthony and Imperials was the predecessors of the Temptations. And I mean that. I mean it harmony-wise and stage presence-wise. They could perform. Nobody could touch Anthony Gordine when it comes to singing or performing on stage. They were great. Speaking of performing, um, you know, you, you not only performed, you know, a lot as a young kid, but, you know, when you got older, you know, you went back on the road with, uh, with the tips for their re reunion tour and all, right. all that. But, you know, in, in terms of just your own personal experience, what do you think the, the most exciting performance that you were involved in was? That's a hard question because you've been in big, big, big venues and little venues, and, and sometimes the little ones are, are as exciting as the, the big ones, but... Mm. The most exciting in my older days yeah. or the younger days? Oh, uh, well, well, we're doing both. Oh boy, in my in my older days, a very exciting time was being in Philadelphia at the Live Aid concert. Uh -huh. Mick Jagger had come to get Eddie and David to go on stage and to do something with them together. Mick Jagger. And uh, so they were singing and we were on the stage and me and Billy Bannister were standing on the side of the stage. And Tina Turner came up to sing. And Mick had David and Eddie. We were all standing on the side of the stage. And when Tina Turner started singing, she called Mick to do some background with 
you know, with Eddie and David. Uh -huh. And we were standing and we were standing there by the mic on the side of the stage. And Tina Turner started singing. And Mick started singing. Eddie and David started singing. And for some reason, Mick got excited. We have more guests. Mick got excited. And Tina was dancing. And Mick, she had a little short mini skirt on. And Mick just grabbed her by the skirt and snatched it off. In front of all those thousands of people, Mick snatched her skirt right off of Tina. And she never missed a beat. She didn't stop. She kept on singing. You know, she's a great performer. She didn't stop her act. She didn't, she kept on. Plus, she had good legs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then, that was another time. And then, that was another time that I considered, uh, I was with the Impressions. Mm -hmm. In Florida. Was this the Brooks Brothers? Right. The Brooks Brothers. Uh, they were the two original tenors. Yeah. With the Impressions. With Jerry Butler and the Impressions. Chattanooga. Hometown boys. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're from Chattanooga. And um, they used to come by and get me sometimes to sing tenor with them. And um, they took me to Florida with them. And we were playing a high school. And we were on the show with the Coasters. And uh, I got a chance to, and I mean, when I say the Coasters, I mean the real Coasters, because I know the Carl Gardner and Jimmy Norman. I got an opportunity to be on the stage with them. Mm -hmm. And it was, real, it was fun. It was fun. And we had a lot of fun. I mean, I've done a lot of things with um, with Eddie Kendricks, but I think the most exciting time was um, was being there in Philadelphia when Mick Jagger snatched her skirt off of Tina, <laughs> and then being with uh, Carl Gardner and Jimmy Norman in uh, in Florida. As far as far as influences for for you, what, what, what person do you think had the most influence on you musically? Oh boy! I think. Uh, It's between Eddie Kendricks and uh, my brother, Rufus. It had to be. Yeah. Um. And, and I, I, yeah, I think uh, I would have to say My brother Rufus and Eddie Kendricks. Just as uh, just as simple as that. They had the biggest, you know, because I never in my life met a person like Eddie Kendricks. And what I mean is that most people I knew enjoyed singing and took it as fun and took it as a way to have good times. But Eddie Kendricks always looked at it as a job. And he always was serious. He would always say, let's go to work. And he always looked at it as a job. He always had respect for Barry Gordy. 
no matter how much other people would say Barry Gordy was his employer. Yeah. And I used to look at him strangely, and he always, he never looked at it as being a star or being big time. As big as the Temptations was, and as big as he was, even when his records was number one, he looked at it like it was a job. He was serious about it and was going to do the best he could. Right. He was serious about it. All the boys from Detroit that I knew looked at it as something else. But that good old Southern boy, oh, Eddie, he looked at it as a job. And he was serious about what he did. And when he went out, he went out to do the best he could. So he had a big influence on me. And then uh, my brother Rufus, because he's a guy who, who never believed in slowing down or quitting. And he don't know. And he don't know what the word quit means, you know. And uh, he put on the same performance, whether you got 200,000 or two, he's the same person. He had a real big influence on me as far as musically. We got an alien, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll end this here on... Give give me kind of a list off the top of your head of you think of what you think were the greatest soul forty fives from nineteen sixty through maybe nineteen seventy or the greatest soul soul forty five mm -hmm. from nineteen sixty through nineteen seventy yeah the the, the golden oh, era, era oh, of soul sixty through seventy the greatest. Um, I would have to say Respect by Aretha Franklin, Midnight Hour by Wilson Pickett, uh, and I'm not ashamed to say that either, uh, and uh, I've Been Loving You Too Long by Otis Redding. Uh -huh. And uh, when you're talking about soul, you got to add, uh, we ain't talking about pop, we're talking about soul. Well, we're talking about. And then. My girl, yeah. my girl, and not, not, not. and then I want you to have everything. Yeah. Got to be in there. <laughs> Got to be. I want you to have everything. Got to be in there. And uh, hope becomes broken hearted. What becomes of the broken heart now, you said has that. to be that has to be in there too. But I considered all those pop records. You said R and B, uh, okay, but well, I considered well, those pop. Okay, but I, well, but well, if they're you put in the pop because okay, I, because, because what what so, what uh, becomes uh, uh, broken heart? If you're talking about that, that has to be in there too. And if we're gonna go that route, we're gonna add a couple of pop tunes in there. Then uh, I can't leave out. Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell. If you go on that route, no. I can't leave out when you're talking about 60 through 70. I can't leave out uh, uh, Marvin Gaye and Tammy. Ain't no mountain high enough. Yeah, that's got to be in there. That's got to be in there. Docker. And now uh, sitting, well, oh, I already had all this ready, but sitting on the dock of the bay, that has to be one of the That's top. a personal song, man. Yeah, that's, that, that. that's real personal. But when you talk about 60 through 70, 
I mean, you got to put, that's the way I would put them out. Because Pickett has to be in there. <laughs> Pickett and Aretha Franklin has to be right up the top. Um, 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 what becomes the Broken Heart? You, you know, you, you told me that, that, that you had a little bit to do with that song. Yeah, you know, um, that was a strange song, too. Songwriting credits be damned, whatever. Because <laughs> we all know what happened to some of those. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I can remember, I can remember distinctly, nobody wanting to have anything to do with that song at all. It was strange the way that song, that song came out in 1966, the early, very early part of 1960, maybe around February, March. And uh, I asked uh, Barry for a box of 25, because it was personal to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jimmy and I were real good friends at the time. And uh, and he needed a hit real bad. and and. And WKLR was a radio station that had just, a black station that they had just established in Toledo. And um, and I was determined, although nobody would know that I had anything to do with it, because my name wasn't on the record. I had a personal interest, so I took the record to everybody. Did you write a little bit of that? That I knew. And... Uh, well, Dean and Holland takes credit for everything. Holland is even on coming to my palace. And he didn't even hear the song until he got in the studio. <laughs> he did the mixing, but he put his name on it and took my portion of it. Anyway, I asked them for a box of 25, and I took it to the disc jockeys that I knew. And uh, and I had a real good friend in Toledo, and I asked him to put it on the playlist, What Becomes of the Broken Hearted. And uh, he played the record, and he played the record, he played the record. No response. No response. People weren't requesting it. It was a strange, when you first hear it, it was a strange sound to the record, simply because uh, it did some of the things that, uh, that my girl did musically. Where my girl, right in the middle of the song, during those early days, nobody was modulating from one key to another key, yeah. like it did on my girl. And then the song, Jimmy, modulated twice. Yeah. And so it was strange for people to hear that in a song. So nobody really requested it. And I asked, so the disc jockey told me he was going to have to get off the record. He said, nobody's requesting it. And I begged him. I said, give me one more week, man. Play it one more week. He played it one more week. Nothing. I sent it to my brother Rufus in California, like I had sent coming to my palace some years earlier to Los Angeles, because Rufus always lived in Los Angeles. You know, he didn't live with us until he, he always lived in Los Angeles. And in about, the record laid around for a while. Nobody heard anything from it, the record. About, maybe about Four or five months later, I came in the, came into Motown one day trying to track the Temptations. I was looking for Eddie, but I was trying to track where they were. I come to look on the board. They had a board that uh, that would tell where our, all the artists was, and I came in. And uh, Miss Edwards told me that. They had an order for a thousand records. That was Jimmy Ruffin. 
I said, a thousand records? Which record? Jimmy got a new record? She said, no, I broke and heard it. I said, where? She said, on the West Coast. <laughs> she said, some guy named the Magnificent Montague has been playing it out there on the West Coast. And they just ordered a thousand records. And that was the first that I heard of the record selling any records at all. A thousand was ordered in California. So when they ordered that thousand, I knew it was on the way. Yeah. You know, one area ordering a thousand. Once that record played in California, it started playing. Then everybody else picked it up and started playing. Uh, it was a giant. His name was the Magni Monarchy of the Magnificent. He started playing it in California. And after that, the record took off and everybody else started playing it. And everybody talked about how phenomenal it was. But nobody wanted to break the record. Really? So you helped us get going. And, um. Uh, yeah. It's, uh. You've you, you, you had a trip across the United States and across the decades. Oh, yeah. In music, haven't you? Oh, yeah. I've been. But I've been the kind of guy that's been real low key. Yeah. And always in the background, I never pumped myself up. Long time ago, man. Yeah. A lot of miles, huh? 